Today's topic is about Guillain-Barre syndrome. Guillain-Barre syndrome is a rare neurological disorder in which your immune system mistakenly attacks parts of the nervous system. It's an acute polyneuropathy and it's also the most common cause of acute flaccid paralysis. The causes of Guillain-Barre syndrome. The cause of Guillain-Barre syndrome is not fully understood, but most cases follow an infection with a virus or bacteria. The most common infection is Campylobacter jejuni. But also there are other infections like Epstein-Barr virus, Mycoplasma pneumonia, and Haemophilus influenza. So following a Campylobacter jejuni infection, the antigen presenting cells present this microbial antigen to the T and B lymphocytes. The B cells will get activated into plasma cells and they will secrete antibodies against these bacterial antigens. Now these antibodies can't differentiate between the actual antigen and the host cell because they all look the same. So they start cross-reacting with the myelin gangliosides. This whole process is called molecular mimicry. So now the antibodies have started attacking this myelin sheath and they will damage the myelin sheath of the nerve resulting in demyelination of the nerve roots. Now let's talk about the variants of Guillain-Barre syndrome. There are different clinical variants that are based on the types of nerve fibers that are involved. Uh, this could be motor, sensory, sensory and motor nerves, cranial or autonomic nerves. The predominant mode of fiber injury, this could be demyelinating or axonal injury. And finally, the presence of an alteration in consciousness. According to these three factors, we can divide Guillain-Barre syndrome into its different variants. Acute inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy or AIDP is the most frequent variant of Guillain-Barre syndrome. And in here, the target damage is done to the myelin sheath resulting in demyelination. In AMAN and AMSAN, that is the acute motor axonal neuropathy and acute motor and sensory axonal neuropathy, the target damage is done to the axon gangliosides. In AMAN, that is acute motor axonal neuropathy, they have target damage to the motor axon gangliosides, whereas in AMSAN, that is the motor and sensory axonal neuropathy, there's involvement in both sensory and motor system. So the patients with AMSAN have a poor prognosis because they have severe involvement of sensory and motor nerve fibers. Another variant of Guillain-Barre syndrome is Miller-Fisher syndrome, that is MFS, and this presents with ophthalmoplegia. This is the first presenting symptom with ataxia and areflexia, but without any weakness. And finally, Bickerstaff's brainstem encephalitis, that is BBE, and this is a variant of Miller-Fisher syndrome, and it's characterized by alteration in consciousness, paradoxical hyperreflexia, ataxia, and ophthalmoparesis. So how do these patients would present to you? So let's quickly go through this graph which represents the presentation of GBS. The symptoms of GBS will start within four weeks of the preceding infection and it usually starts from the lower limbs and progresses upwards. So this is an ascending type paralysis. Symptoms will peak within two to four weeks and fortunately, most people will eventually recover. However, after the recovery, some people will still continue to have some degree of weakness. Around 60 to 80% of the patients will have complete resolution, while 20% of them can develop respiratory failure. So when we are talking about their symptoms, they have muscle weakness, they can have cranial nerve lesions, they can have abnormalities in their reflexes, sensory symptoms and pain, autonomic changes, and respiratory involvement. When it comes to muscle weakness, in a typical presentation of Guillain-Barre syndrome, this is a rapidly progressive bilateral symmetrical weakness. The weakness usually starts in the distal lower extremities and then progresses upwards over a period of hours to days. This is an ascending symmetrical type of weakness and this can ascend until the arms and cranial nerves which would lead to facial, oculomotor and bulbar weakness. So what are the cranial nerve lesions? The most frequently observed lesion is facial nerve weakness, but they can also have lesions in cranial nerve 3, 5, 6, 9, 10, and 12. So these patients can present with ptosis, ophthalmoparesis, facial droop, dysphagia, 
dysarthria and disorders in the eye and in severe cases they can have tonic pupils. These patients are areflexic or they have hyporeflexia and it is one of the two clinical features that is required for the diagnosis of Guillain-Barre syndrome. When it comes to sensory symptoms and pain, the most common initial symptom is acroparesthesia which would be progressing upwards but it doesn't generally extend beyond the wrist or ankles. They can have moderate to severe neuropathic or radicular pain and also have a mild lower back or hip pain. In patients who have Guillain-Barre syndrome, there is a dysfunction in the parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system. So they can present with sustained sinus tachycardia, postural hypertension, which can present as presyncope or syncope, sweating dysfunction, they can present with anhydrosis or diaphoresis, and urinary retention and constipation. Respiratory involvement is a very important feature in Guillain-Barre syndrome. Up to 20 to 30 percent of GBS cases progress to respiratory failure and this is due to the involvement of the lower cranial nerves or because of the demyelination of the phrenic nerve and as you all know the phrenic nerve supplies the diaphragm which is a very important muscle that is assisting in breathing. So these patients can present with dyspnea on exertion, shortness of breath, difficulty in swallowing and slurred speech. So if we quickly recap the clinical features of Guillain-Barre syndrome, it's a quick onset, rapidly progressive, bilateral symmetrical, ascending type weakness with global air reflexia, with the involvement of lower limb, upper limb, cranial nerves, and autonomic nervous system dysfunction. Diagnosis of Guillain-Barre syndrome. Diagnosis of Guillain-Barre syndrome is based on the typical clinical picture of the acute flaccid paralysis. We can do a nerve conduction test. Decreased conduction velocities or the conduction blocks are indicators of demyelination process. So in Guillain-Barre syndrome, you can get reduced conduction velocity. The signs of demyelination on motor nerve conductions in AIDP is the distal latency period would be lengthened or delayed and they can have conduction blocks because in AIDP there is loss of myelin sheath so they are going to have reduced conduction velocity. In the axonal variant of the disease that is the AMAN and AMSAN they will have decreased amplitudes in compound muscle action potential in AMAN, decreased amplitude in compound muscle action potential and sensory nerve action potential in AMSAN. We can also do a cerebrospinal fluid examination which should be done on day 10 or 14 where you will have high protein content and no cells and this is called albumin cytological dissociation. This is all explained in the Brighton's criteria for the diagnosis of Guillain-Barre syndrome. So how do we treat and manage these patients? GBS patients are at high risk of developing many complications and some of them may even lead to death. So because of that, close monitoring is crucial to predict and prevent potential complications. So the management of GBS is divided into five key segments. Number one is monitoring progression. Number two is prevention and management of potentially fatal complications. Number three is general care of the patient. Number four, specific therapies. Number five is rehabilitation and physiotherapy. To monitor the progression, we can check their muscle powers in the limbs and we can monitor their respiratory muscle for paralysis and autonomic dysfunction. We can monitor their respiration by checking their vital capacity, single breath count and using other tests. In a normal patient, the vital capacity is around 75 milliliters per kilogram and if it is less than 15 milliliters per kilogram in a GBS patient, we have to start ventilation. And if we can't use the uh, vital capacity, we can use another method that is the single breath count. In a normal person, that is more than 25. If the single breath count is lower and it's progressively declining, then we have to be on alert. We can also use other tests like an arterial blood gas or pulse oximeter. When we're thinking about autonomic dysfunction, we can monitor their pulse rate and blood pressure. So if they have an autonomic fluctuation, those patients must be admitted to the ICU. When we are talking about general care, most of these patients are bedridden 
So we have to think about bladder bowel care, skin care, and prevent decubitus ulcers. Artificial tears can be given to prevent corneal ulcerations. If they have swallowing dysfunctions, we can use nasogastric feeding to prevent aspiration. And since they are bed bound, they are very prone to get deep vein thrombosis. So prevention of deep vein thrombosis should also be a concern. The specific treatment that is targeting the Guillain-Barre syndrome is intravenous immunoglobulin and plasmapheresis. They both are equally effective. Physiotherapy and rehabilitation is very important in these patients. Physiotherapy should be started very early and rehabilitation should also be commenced as soon as there's an improvement in the patients. So when do you admit these patients to the ICU? If they have breathlessness at rest or during talking, they are unable to count to 15 when you are doing the single breath test. Using accessory muscles for respiration, their vital capacity is less than 15 milliliters per kilogram and they have an abnormal ABG. So that's all about Guillain-Barre syndrome. I'll see you on the next video. Thank you for watching.